Hello, Eric King coming to you once again from Nugget of Truth. Today we're going to talk about a Christological issue. Now when we deal with Christology, we're dealing with the definition of the person of Jesus Christ. And we know that in early church history, that was the issue. You know, when we study theology, theology is categorized into different topics. Like you have um, soteriology, which is the study of salvation. You have eschatology, which is the study of end time events and uh, prophecy. You have ecclesiology, which is the study of, of the church. And, different er and, and my point is you have different areas of theology. The most important one to the early church was Christology, which was you really had to know who Jesus Christ claimed to be in order to fully comprehend the message of Christianity. And the early Christian church, specifically the Antiochian church, we know is correct, and we, we've taught that here. Um, the Antiochian church being grounded early on by Apostle Peter, uh, Paul, and Barnabas. And um, we, we quoted here early statements and records from the Antiochian church showing that they understood the triune uh, nature of the Godhead. Um, they were the first ones under the seventh bishop, Theophilus, to use the word Trinity. Um, they, um, they understood the dual nature of Christ. And all of these other issues they understood early on in the Antiochian church. And they didn't become debatable issues until you get into the second, late, later into the second century um, uh, after Christ. Specifically, when you get into like uh, the early 300s, um, you have the Arius controversy from Arian. Arius uh, um, uh, questioning the divinity of Christ, claiming that Christ was a created being. And then you have another one that we're going to be looking at today called monophysitism. Monophysitism um, actually became before the heresy of Arius. And monophysitism, some pronounce it monophysitism. I've pronounced it both ways. And i got to say here that here at Negative Truth, being an English Gentile convert, um, my pronunciation of Greek varies, um, and some of you have noticed that. I, I've studied with different theologians uh, throughout my life, and there's been slightly different pronunciations of words. Um, today we're going to be looking at monophysitism. That's how it's pretty much properly pronounced. Again, some people pronounce that monophysitism. I've pronounced it both ways. Uh, I do this with other Greek words. For instance, the Didache or the Didac or or uh, didac, it's pronounced, which is a, an early writing of the church. I pronounce that three different ways. The word we use for, the Greek word for a rapture, harpazo, is, has been pronounced har, harpezo, harpezio, harpazo. So I want to make, make it clear that sometimes the Greek varies here at Nugget of Truth, but if you do your own research, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, again, today we're going to be looking at myophysitism. And it was the teaching, basically, that Christ was single-natured. And this is very important for us to understand because um, we have to know who God is for us in the person of Jesus Christ in order to, to understand properly um, what Jesus Christ did for us uh, when, when the Word or the Logos became incarnate. It became man when Jesus became man in the flesh for us. Now we hear it at Nugget of Truth and the Shepherd's Way except the dual nature of Christ. The Bible clearly teaches the dual nature of Christ, um, that Jesus was fully human and fully God, fully man and fully deity. Jesus, uh, this is a mystery. You know, it's interesting because when we look at other religions, other pagan religions, they use their the human intellect to understand God so much so that if they can't understand it, then they change the doctrine so that they can understand it. Christianity is not like that. Uh, there's many things in our Christian faith that we can't s explain from human wisdom or from human intellectual point of view. We accept them because the Bible teaches them. We accept them through faith. And they're experiential for us in faith. And through faith, they become realities to us. Um, so, in monophysitism, it was the belief that, that Jesus was fully divine and he appeared to be human only. He, wasn't, he didn't really have a human nature, according to physitism, mo, uh, monophysitism. Of course, the, the contrary, the, the, uh, the, the, this, this doctrine was associated with, a, with a, a man by the name of Eutychus. He died in 454 uh, AD. And, and again, Eutychus, this, this, this false Christological viewpoint comes later on the scene, just as Arius follows him, comes later on the scene and starts to use human reason and logic to dissect the divinity of Christ in so much so 
that they lose the, the truth of the reality of what the, the gospel teaches. We, would say, we could say that, that Arius' teachings were the antithesis of, uh, of monophysitism, uh, being the extreme opposite. So you have two extreme heresies, one leaning completely that Jesus was only a created being, which is what Arius taught, and one uh, uh, monophysitism saying that no, he was only divine. And, and he only appeared to have a human nature. So you have these two, these two, and, and the truth is right in the middle. The truth there is right in the middle. It's not this extreme or that extreme. So the doctrine of monophysitism was rejected at the Council of Chalcedon. Now we've talked about the, the Ecumenical Council of Chalcedon, which happened in 451 AD. There were many issues addressed there. Um, Nestorius from the Antiochian school, Nestorius was the one, of course, again, all the unadulterated early truths coming from the Antiochian school, Nestorius was the one that, that taught correctly uh, the dual nature of Christ. And, um, and so at, at the Council of Chalcedon, the dual nature of Christ was accepted. Um, and it was worded differently by different bishops at that time. So some look at that issue of monophysitism kind of being compromised uh, at the Council of Chalcedon, like or slightly accepted, so to speak, at the Council of Chalcedon, and we see a reoccurrence of the issue uh, being brought out again. And there were many derivatives of this doctrine. It wasn't very a very clear cut doctrine. This monophysitism was not a very clear doctrine. But we understand that early on the development, the the development of the uh, of the, uh, the the doctrine of the Trinity was progressive. We could say it was uh, the Trinitarian doctrine was was young at this time, meaning that it was not yet fully established or 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 articulated by the church, and that happened over a period process of time where men and, and women of faith learned how to articulate the, the Godhead better, even though we can't fully understand it. So this was early on in the church; these these different issues having to do with Christology, who was the person of Christ. These are early on. Now, diophysitism was, was the belief that Nestorius taught, which is correct, which is the scriptural belief that, that Jesus did, in fact, have, was fully human and fully God at the same time. That would be a diophysistic uh, 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 approach that we take here, and which maintains the two natures of Jesus, human and divine. Now, there's a scripture I want to bring up here before we continue a little bit further regarding this issue, and it's found in... Paul's epistle to the Philippians, uh, chapter 2, and starting at verse 5. And he's talking here about Yeshua, Jesus the Christ, and here's what he says to us Christians. He says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider him consider equality with God something to be grasped, but, but made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of of a servant, and being made in human likeness. Now, the word I'm reading from the NIV. The word nature there is actually the Greek word for form. And there's two words for form used in the Greek. Um, one of the interesting things about Greek is um, uh, uh, Greek has more than one word that that for the same thing, but they, but they have a different, slightly different flavor to them. So that Greek is very precise. I mean, there, there's, there, there's four different words for one, for one English word that we have for, to announce something, whereas in Greek it has four different words which are synonymous with each other, but have slightly different flavors so that, so that they can become more accurate. And the, uh, the Greek word for form here, for form here, I believe is uh, metamorphy in the Greek, metamorphy. Um, the other Greek word for form um, starts with an S, I can't remember the name of it, but the other Greek word for form that's not used here um, is, is, is a more malleable uh, term for form, whereas metamorphy in the Greek is not malleable, it's, 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 can't, it's unchangeable. So uh, the idea that Paul is giving here is that God took on the very unchangeable form of humanity. He didn't appear to be human, but he took on the complete nature. Uh, that's why actually the, the NIV here opts for the word nature and uh, for the Greek word metamorphy. 
um, because that's exactly what it means. So if you read um, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, you'll see there that Paul clearly states the dual nature of the Christos, Jesus Christos, that, that he had a dual nature. Now, the Monophysites uh, rejected the Council of Chalcedon. There were some Christians at the Council of Chalcedon in 451 where this issue was addressed. There were some Christians that rejected that. <clears throat> and I have to say again here and reiterate the fact that this heresy came out of the school of Alexandria. We, we note here in our studies that most of the main heresies dealing specifically with Christology started in the school of Alexandria, not in the school of Antioch. As a matter of fact, the school of Alexandria... Um, there was more of an excitement over a lot more struggles in the school of Alexandria going on, which, which later was the school that influenced the Roman Catholic Church. And, 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 and they had so much uh, controversies and, and heresies going on that they actually did lose touch with the reality of the scriptures as the school of Alexandria progressed. They went into all millennialism. They went into post-millennial views. They went into... Um, uh, uh, deification of Mary as a coin, as a as a conjoint mediatrix with Christ. They went into all of the uh, praying to saints, um, all, all kinds of error. The Alexandrian school blossomed into apostasy, whereas the Antiochian school s the, hugged tight to the scriptures, to the Word of God, and um, and so again, Arius uh, Ar Arianism comes out of the Alexandrian school. That that heresy, uh, mono. Uh, Isotism comes out of the Alexandrian school, not the Antiochian school. Um, and as I said before, uh, there were many derivatives of this doctrine of monophysitism. And again, it was Nestorius who properly taught the two natures of Christ, though Nestorius had other theological issues, which we've talked about in another talk here at Negative Truth. But it's important to note another thing that Nestorius also rejected at the Council of at, at the Council of Chalcedon that, that he and his students rejected, and that was the, the use of the term Theotokos, mother of God or God-bearer for Mary. The Bible does not use the word, um, uh, conjointly does not use Theotokos anywhere in the Greek scriptures. Uh, Mary is called um, the mother of our Lord, Kurios, She's called, and the Lord there is, is the regal title for Christ as Messiah, and so Nestorius said that it would be better to call Mary the mother of the Messiah or the Mashiach, the mother of the Christos, rather than the mother of God. And it's not that Nestorius didn't believe in the divinity of Christ. He did believe in the divinity of Christ, but he saw the dangers of when you start calling Mary mother of God, it, it gives this idea that God had a beginning. And, um, and of course, when we read the, the epistle to Hebrews, it says of, of Jesus ultimately, of Jesus, the Logos. It says, having no father or mother, ultimately. So if we go by Scripture and we stick with Scripture, we should call Mary Christotokos, Christotokos, or the mother of Christ, mother of Kurios, and we should stick with the epistle of Hebrews where Jesus ultimately doesn't have a father or mother. He's eternal. So Nestorius, Nestorius was sharp. He was from the school of Antioch. And, of course, some, later on, some things that, er, that Nestorius taught were twisted, and we've covered that in other and other studies here. Now, those churches that 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 accepted the proper understanding of the dual nature of Christ became known as Chalcedonian churches because they accepted basically the creed that was put forth there called Chalcedon. And basically, this is this is what we could say what the the, the Chalcedon uh, Council of Chalcedon arrived at regarding the dual natures. We could say this is how it's word here. Here's how it was worded: the understanding of that dual nature. Here it is made known, that is Christ, made known in two natures without confusion, which is to say without mixture, so two natures, without change, without division, without separation, the difference of the natures being by no means removed because of the union, but the property of each nature being preserved and coalescing in one prosopon in the Greek, or one person. They still understood Christ to be one person, so we don't see Christ as two persons. No, Christ is one person with two natures that, that are not intermixed or, or, or amalgamated, but maintain their separateness in one person, both divinity and humanity. But the property of each nature being preserved and coalescing in one prosopon, one person, and one hypostasis or substance, and one substance, not parted or divided into two prosopa or persons, 
but one and the same Son, only begotten, divine, Logos, the Lord uh, Jesus Christos. And this is the, what they arrived at. And they were very careful at how they worded things. And that was one of the things that we key in on here, is that when these statements of faith were produced at these ecumenical councils, the wording of them was critical because, because you, were, you were dealing sometimes with more than one heresy and you wanted to make sure you covered your bases so that when you pronounced what the Christian church truly believed in, it was very precise, not allowing any loopholes to come in and, and create um, a distorted um, doctrine. So ultimately, the Chalcedonian uh, doctrine of the dual nature of Christ was accepted by the Roman church was accepted by the Constantinople Church, and of course was accepted by the Antiochian Church from which it originated in the first place. The true pure doctrines, what we call pure doctrine, a lot of it, all of it, really um, came out of Antioch. That's why we like to refer to ourselves here at Nugget of Truth and Shepherd's Way as Antiochian Christians, holding to that pure uh, Antiochian truth. Now, um, there was other view that was taken on. There was another view that was taken on um, uh, regarding the dual nature of Christ by Cyril. And Cyril was again a bishop, again, coming from, guess where? The school of Alexandria. Cyril of Alexandria, he was appointed the patriarch of... of, Alex, of uh, he was appointed patriarch in 412 AD. And he produced a doctrine which we're not going to talk about here. We're going to... We're going to we're going to reserve that for a latter study, but he reserved. He talked about a doctrine called Myophysitism, and this became um, popular in, um, uh, we could say, the Oriental churches of that time. So there were still non-Chalcedonian churches. There were still churches that accepted Monophysitism, and there was other churches that accepted another doctrine called um, uh, Miaphysitism. Miaphysitism by Cyril. And um, so monophysitism began as the uh, as the anti as the antithesis of Nestorianism, and and Arianism became the antithesis of Myophysitism or Myophysitism. So again, it was Eutychus that started this heresy um, at the time when the doctrine of the Trinity was in its early stages of being fully elaborated and articulated, and it was tackled at the Council of Chalcedon in 451, and, and Myophysitism was rejected by the true Christians, uh, among other issues that were dealt with there. And Alexandria agreed with the Chalcedon conclusion, ultimately, uh, which was looked upon as somewhat of a compromise. And, and we've talked about this in other studies. Alexandria's would accept the truth sometimes, but they would always ask the Antiochian school, can you reword it just a little bit so that we can still hold on to our heresy? We see that happening at the Council of Chalcedon when, because the fact of the matter is everything went really downhill dramatically from Chalcedon because, because the Greek church uh, compromised with, uh, with the Alexandrian school and allowed the, the title of Theotokos to enter, uh, fully enter and be accepted at the Council of Chalcedon. Which, 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 which led, as we know, to, um, uh, to the worshiping of Mary and praying to Mary and the semi-deification of Mary. So, monophysitism uh, lingers today in some po pockets of uh, churches uh, over there in the Middle East and in Europe. Monophysitism or physitism still exists in, in pockets and, and, and um, eventually Emperor Justin... Um, later on, Emperor, this issue came up again and again and again, and Emperor Justin reaffirmed the Chalcedonian truth uh, of, of the doctrine of the dual nature of Christ. And so the doctrine has been preserved in the true church of Jesus Christ from the Antiochian school, and it is still preserved in the true church today. Again, uh, monophysitism was the idea that Christ was single-natured, that he was divinity only, and only merely took on the appearance of humanity, whereas the true doctrine is that Jesus was dual-natured in one prosopon, in one person. So I hope that this helps you understand monophysitism, and in our next study, we're going to look at another important doctrine uh, uh, promoted um, by uh, Sibelius, another heresy that has to do with the doctrine called modelism. 
And all again, that doctrine of modelism has to do also with the divinity of Christ and Christology. And these are important issues for us to understand because we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna understand in our next study that that right here in the United States there are churches that accept the other heresy of Arius, and Arianism is being taught amongst the cults, and even some Protestants uh, claim to be um, uh, claim to an Arianistic view of Christ, which is which is heretical. Now, again, in closing, I want to say here, we here at Nugget of Truth and the Shepherd's Way, we do not claim to be Protestant. Uh, we claim to be the original universal church taught there and struggling with these issues all up to 451 AD, when the, after that the two biggest schisms of the Greek and the Roman church began. And we really pray for both of those entities and all of the offshoots through the Reformation that came off of them. We hold to the original teachings of the Antiochian Church. We promote the true teachings of Sola Scriptura. We hold to Sola Scriptura. And I want to say one other thing in ending this study, which we're going to be looking at in coming up lectures. Um, just because we accept Sola Scriptura does not mean uh, that, we, that we dishonor tradition. We do honor certain traditions, but we don't look at those traditions as commandments uh, from the scriptures given to us. They're not something that, that, you, that you must do to be a Christian. So even though we're sola scriptura, that is, we base all our doctrine on scripture alone, it is okay, according to Romans chapter 14, and we've, we've briefly touched this in other passages of scripture, that we can honor Christian tradition, but it has to be honored in the spirit of sola scriptura. It has to agree with the scriptures. We don't do any traditions that would dishonor the word of God or contradict the word of God. But we do, we do honor traditions. We look at traditions as a way, uh, as, as an outlet for us to reach other people uh, with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. So even though we're sola scriptura, we do maintain certain Christian traditions in our faith. And there's nothing wrong with that. And we're going to have studies and lectures coming up regarding these very issues. In the meantime, remaining God's word here at Nugget